Thanks to Star Trek Fleet Command for sponsoring this video. The Borg are back in Star Trek Fleet Command. This is the largest aircraft ever designed. With a wingspan of over 1,000 feet, 500 feet long, nose to tail, and powered by a vast nuclear reactor, this flying aircraft carrier monster is the jet age equivalent of the Star Trek Enterprise. It can fly around the world without refueling, hover over a city and deploy up to 24 fighter jets, and it even carried 10 nuclear-tipped ICBMs, the ultimate weapon of peace. But who came up with this insane aircraft, why was it designed, and why was it never built? Today on your favorite aviation channel, we'll be revisiting one of the most nutty aerospace concepts to celebrate half a million subscribers. Welcome to the world of the incredible CL1201. In the 1960s, the American military had a problem. There was a very real chance that they could be cut off from their European allies and their bases around the world, leaving them incredibly isolated in North America. While ships had been the mainstay of deployment overseas for the last hundred years, jet technology had given rise to a bigger, better and faster form of travel, namely the Boeing 747. Lockheed, always hungry for government contracts and especially jealous of the Boeing 747, took the idea of the plane and essentially ran with it. How big could they actually design an aircraft? The answer is the CL1201 proposal, which consisted of three different aircraft. The CL1201-1-1 attack aircraft carrier, the CL1201-2, which I'll get to later, and the CL1201-1-3 called the logistics support carrier. This design was based on a previous submarine hunter blended wing body concept that Lockheed was cooking up the year before. And let me know if you want to see a video on it down in the comments. With over 2 million cubic meters of eternal space, this aerospace concept could easily carry an entire US Army Brigade slice in one go to anywhere in the world within hours, an ability that was pretty much like science fiction back in the 1960s. To get some perspective on how big this is, and using that same science fiction metric of the time, Star Trek, this is roughly 10 times more space on board than Kirk's Enterprise, which the Constitution class had around 200,000 meters of cubic space. So this was a ridiculously big aircraft. Ironically, the Enterprise under the next generation would have been twice as big as a CL-1201 at 5 million cubic meters, making this aircraft snugly in between both of them. You can imagine had this aircraft been built, the captain on board would have felt like a real-life Star Trek fleet commander. But you at home don't have to be in charge to feel that way today, not when we have the fantastic game called Star Trek Fleet Command. In this awesome free game that's on iOS, Android and Windows, you get to engage in a story-driven Star Trek galaxy with your own fleet of starships and iconic characters, from Spock to Data to Michael Burnham. Explore the entire Star Trek universe with real-time combat and mysteries that only you can solve. The Borg are back in new missions inspired by the iconic appearances in Star Trek The Next Generation. Join fan favorite Hugh the Borg and help him stop a scientist's quest for revenge against the Collective. Save an eager pack lead from himself as he tries to get the Borg to assimilate him on purpose. Prevent the Borg from assimilating the technology behind your AI assistant, Maya. Plus, all those with starbases can use a cool new feature, assigning well-known Star Trek heroes and villains to oversee strategy from their starbases for increased power and effectiveness in the game. Fleet Commanders launches with three choices, Admiral James T. Kirk, Captain Spock, or Locutus of Borg. So if this is right up your alley and you want to customize your dream crew of iconic characters and starships with unique powers to make you stand out as the strongest in the galaxy, then click that link in the description. You'll not only be getting a fun free game that's on Windows, iOS and Android, but you'll also be supporting the channel and letting me keep making the animations that you love, 
all 500,000 of you. So with your help, we can warp straight to the next half a million subscribers and reach that coveted million milestone. With its internal space, Lockheed would propose 10 to 12 million pounds or 5,440 tons of cargo carrying capacity spread over several decks. And just like Kirk's five-year mission of exploration, this aircraft would have a capacity to fly for 41 days straight, with six decks for crew sleeping, recreation, a mess hall, strategic command and more, not including the vast cargo bay, 22 times bigger than the Antonov 225. During deployment and flight, any operations to move equipment around would need to be coordinated to prevent the center of gravity shifting too much. And for such a huge plane, conventional fuel wouldn't cut it. And because warp drives haven't been invented yet, this sucker would be nuclear powered, with the reactor system giving out a combined 1.83 gigawatts, allowing this plane to fly for 48 days straight at Mach 0.8 at over 16,000 feet, only having to land because the crew would run out of food and water. The crew of course would be 475 personnel, which may go up to 800 during an active combat zone mission. The size required because they would need to maintain operations for over 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The reactor itself wouldn't need to be refueled for over a thousand operational hours, which roughly comes to around that 40 days mark. Let's discuss the first design, the attack aircraft carrier. It would carry 11 fighter bombers under each wing and two more in the fuselage hangars for a total of 24 aircraft. While we don't know what these final mini jets would have been, in the documents they're listed as F-4 Phantoms. So perhaps they would have been some sort of parasite fighter, which we know that Lockheed was actually working on around about at the same time. The idea was that this plane would serve as the spearhead of the start of an invasion or a military power projection, and would be the command center for any major military operation. So you can imagine this would have been used extensively in something like Desert Storm. The plane would also carry 10 long range attack missiles, with Lockheed not ruling out that their warheads would be nuclear tipped. This plane would never land in enemy territory, simply circling the battlefield at 30,000 feet and around 600 miles away. This seems like the same idea as the airborne carrier aircraft that we already covered on the channel, but scaled up by a ridiculous amount. As for going deep behind enemy lines, that was up to its bigger brother, the Dash 3 version, called the Logistic Support Aircraft or LSA. This version of the plane would be the carrier for the bulk of the mission, bringing in drop troops and other equipment. It would carry 400 troops and 1100 tons of cargo. But you might be wondering, how did the LSA deploy these troops? After all, it wasn't landing. Well, that's the job of the equally ridiculous medium inter-theater transport planes, essentially converted Boeing 707s that would fly troops and materials back and forth from the LSA whilst it was in the air. The LSA would have a fleet of five of these aircraft that would physically dock three at a time to the LSA whilst in flight. The planes would approach from the rear and connect to the back of the plane, power down their engines and open the nose through a special airlock. These planes would then fly troops and gear to drop zones for paratrooper operations or land at friendly or captured airports. In addition to the 400 troops on the LSA, there would be 150 troops on each MIT to a combined power of 1,150 troops in the entire mini fleet. But these aircraft wouldn't actually operate on their own. Yes, that's right, there would be a fleet group of a single attack aircraft carrier and seven, yes, that's right, seven LSA carriers. In total, the combined fleet would carry around 8,050 ground troops, 6,207 tons of equipment, 30 days of food and water, artillery, light aircraft, and attack helicopters. Enough for a complete invasion of almost any country in the world. Sounds pretty fantastic, right? So why did the United States never build this insane aircraft? Let's discuss the flaws of the design. First of all, we need to address the elephant in the room. 
how on earth would this gigantic aircraft take to the skies? After all, with a wingspan so wide and 8 feet wide wheels approximately 200 meters along the wing, the runway itself would need to easily be 650 feet wide, let alone how long it would actually need to cross for it to take off. No such runway exists, and several will need to be built for the extra capacity for worldwide operations. But designers thought of this and came up with an honestly pretty genius solution. The aircraft wouldn't take off from a runway at all. It would fly vertically just like a Harrier jet. The LSA would use 54 recently developed turbojet engines from the Boeing 747 to provide over 82,000 pounds of thrust. The aircraft attack version would need a staggering 182 jets to provide vertical lift. Each engine would be in clusters of 20 throughout the plane with a spine of engines running along each wing. Once the plane got above 16,000 feet, the four massive turbojet engines, each with the diameter of a Boeing 747, would power up with the tips going supersonic. If they rotated at around 2,000 rotations per minute, the tips would be moving at over 4,000 feet per second. Such engine technology is almost beyond today's level of technology and would have been an impressive feat for the designers back in 1969. To power all of these engines, the CL-1201 would have a nuclear fission reactor that would provide that necessary amount of electricity for operations on board. Although the plane would also carry a small fuel complement as a backup and to ensure that the VTOL capacity worked when needed. To keep the crew safe from radiation during flight, the 30 feet wide reactor core would have 20 feet of radiation protection adding to the enormous weight. To keep cool, liquid metal would be used to transport the heat to the exterior of the plane where it would be cooled by the air outside. To prevent radioactive material spilling out during a crash, the reactor was designed to shut down within 20 seconds and could survive a head-on impact with a mountain traveling at 600 miles an hour without breaking apart. Speaking of impact, the designers also realized that it would be susceptible to missile attacks. Thus, the solution was a laser cannon and point defense systems to blow any rockets out of the sky whilst in flight. But as we don't have many lasers in use today on aircraft, you can kind of see how this idea would have gone. In the end, the CL-1201 project didn't get any further along thanks to its cost, how ridiculous it was, and how exactly the US would need to deploy it. Simply put, it's just completely bonkers. But maybe, and this is the crazy part, maybe a prototype was built. That's right, it's time to pull out the tinfoil and believe in something so crazy sounding that maybe there is a little nugget of the truth. In March of 1997, there was a series of widely sighted UFO objects across Arizona, Nevada, and Mexico, dubbed the Phoenix Lights. Witnesses described the object as flying as a giant V that was bigger than a 747 and sounded like a gushing wind. Despite being nighttime, witnesses saw several lights like those found on aircraft, and the object was huge, that it visibly hit the stars from the sky. Now, I've already covered this exact event here on the channel, and when you start to put it together with a CL-1201, it starts to make sense. At the beginning of the video, I mentioned that there were three versions of the CL-1201, but I never went into detail about the second version, because it's been scrubbed from history. It's highly possible that this second version was to be some sort of spy platform, some sort of massive installation that could fly around the world before the invention of spy satellites and be used to spy anywhere at any time. And perhaps it incorporated rudimentary stealth technology that back then would make it not able to be detected by radar. Special thanks to Scott from Aerospace Projects Review who helped with the research for the original video and his continuous help in the channel so far. You are a legend just like the other 500,000 people that have watched 
this channel. Deep Space Nine is arriving in Star Trek Fleet Command, and Star Trek Fleet Command is available on iOS, Android, and Windows. Download now using my link below or by scanning the QR code to join the fight. I really do want to say thanks so much to sponsors like these, like Star Trek Fleet Command, and those people that check them out. You are the people that are powering the channel forward, and I can't wait to see where we go next. And if you enjoyed today's content and you're new to the channel, it's time for you to click subscribe and check out the many other videos right here. Thanks again so much for watching guys and I actually am going off script here right at the end of the video because I've finished now and uh, I just want to say man 500,000 that's completely crazy and if you're one of the people seeing this before the 500,000 milestones being reached well then you're a little bit extra special. Thanks for watching.